16. Claudia Musio. A Child of the Opera. In Tales of Romance one reads sometimes of a gifted girl who lives in a musical atmosphere all her life, imbibing artistic influences as naturally and almost as unconsciously as the air she breathes. At the right moment, she suddenly comes out into the light and blossoms into a full-fledged singer, to the surprise and wonder of all her friends. Or she is brought up behind the scenes in some great opera house of the world, where, all unnoticed by her elders, she lives in a dream world of her own, peopled by the various characters in the operas to which she daily listens. She watches the stage so closely and constantly that she unconsciously commits the roles of the heroines she most admires to memory. She knows what they sing, how they act the various parts, how they impersonate the characters. Again, at the right moment, the leading prima donna is indisposed. There is no one to take her place. Manager is in despair when the slip of a girl, who is known to have a voice, but has never sung an opera, offers to go on in place of the absent one. She is finally permitted to do so. Result, a popular success. Some pages of Claudia Musio's musical story read like the romantic experiences of a novel heroine. She, too, was brought up in great opera houses, and it seemed natural that in due course of time, she should come into her own, in the greatest lyric theater of the land of her adoption. When she returned to America a couple of years ago, after gaining experience in Europe, she arrived toward the end of the season preceding her scheduled debut here, to prepare herself more fully for the coming appearance awaiting her. I was asked to meet and talk with the young singer to ascertain her manner of study and some of her ideas regarding the work which lay before her. It was always my dream to sing at the Metropolitan, and my dream has come true. Claudia Musio said the words with her brilliant smile, as her great soft dark eyes gazed luminously at the visitor. The day was cold and dreary without, but the singer's apartment was of tropical warmth. A great bowl of violets on the piano exhaled delicious fragrance, the young Italian in the bloom of her oriental beauty seemed like some luxuriant tropical blossom herself. Claudia Musio, who is just about to take her place among the personnel of the Metropolitan, is truly to the manner born, a real child of the opera. She has lived in opera all her life, has imbibed the operatic atmosphere from her earliest remembrance. It must be as necessary for a singer who aspires to fill a high place in this field of artistic endeavor to live amid congenial surroundings as for a pianist, violinist, or composer to be environed by musical influences. Yes, I am an Italian, she began, for I was born in Italy, but when I was two years old I was taken to London, and my childhood was passed in that great city. My father was stage manager at Covent Garden and has also held the same post at the Manhattan and Metropolitan Opera Houses in New York. So I have grown up in the theater. I have always listened to opera daily, and my childish imagination was fired by seeing the art of the great singers. I always hoped I should one day become a singer, so I always watched the artists in action, noting how they did everything. As a result, I do not now have to study acting as a separate branch of the work, for acting comes to me naturally. I am very temperamental. I feel intuitively how the role should be enacted. All tiny children learn to sing little songs, and I was no exception. I acquired quite a number and, at the age of six, exhibited my accomplishments at a little recital. But I never had singing lessons until I began to study seriously at about the age of sixteen. Although I did not study the voice till I reached that age, I was always occupied with music, for I learned as a little girl to play both harp and piano. We lived in London, of which city I am very fond, from the time I was two, till I was fourteen, then we came to America. After residing here a couple of years, it was decided I should make a career, and we went to Italy. I was taken to Madame Anna Casaloni at Torino. She was quite elderly at that time, but she had been a great singer. When she tried my voice, 
She told me it was quite properly placed, so I had none of that drudgery to go through. At first my voice was a very light soprano, hardly yet a coloratura. It became so a little later, however, and then gradually developed into a dramatic soprano. I am very happy about this fact, for I love to portray tears as well as laughter, sorrow and tragedy as well as lightness and gaiety. The coloratura manner of singing is all delicacy and lightness, and one cannot express deep emotion in this way. We subsequently went to Milano, where I studied with Madame Viviani, a soprano who had enjoyed great success on the operatic stage. After several years of serious study, I was ready to begin my career. So I sang in Milan and other Italian cities, then at Covent Garden, and now I am in the Metropolitan. In Italy, I created the role of Fiora in Amore del Tre Re and sang with Ferrari Fontana. I also created Francesca in Francesca da Rimini under its composer, Zandanai. I have a repertoire of about 30 operas and am, of course, adding to it constantly, as one must know many more than 30 roles. Since coming to New York, I have learned Ida, which I did not know before and have already appeared in it. It was learned thoroughly in eight days. Now I am at work on Madame Butterfly. Technical Practice I work regularly every morning on vocal technique. Not necessarily a whole hour at a stretch, as some do, but as much time as I feel I need. I give practically my whole day to study so that I can make frequent short pauses in technical practice. If technique is studied with complete concentration and vigor, as it always should be, it is much more fatiguing than singing an opera role. You ask about the special forms of exercises I use. I sing all the scales, one octave each, one slow and once fast, all in one breath. Then I sing triplets on each tone, as many as I can in one breath. I can sing about 15 now, but I shall doubtless increase the number. For all these I use full power of tone. Another form of exercise is to take one tone softly, then go to the octave above, which tone is also sung softly, but there is a large crescendo made between the two soft tones. My compass is three octaves from C below middle C to two octaves above that point. I also have C sharp, but I do not practice it, for I know I can reach it if I need it, and I save my voice. Neither do I work on the final tones of the lowest octave for the same reason, to preserve the voice. Breath control. Every singer knows how important is the management of the breath. I always hold the chest up, taking as long breaths as I can conveniently do. The power to hold the breath and sing more and more tones with one breath grows with careful, intelligent practice. There are no rules about the number of phrases you can sing with a single breath. A teacher will tell you, if you can sing two phrases with one breath, do so. If not, take breath between. It all rests with the singer. Memorizing. I learn words and music of a role at the same time, for one helps the other. When I have mastered a role, I know it absolutely, words, music, and accompaniment. I can always play my accompaniments, for I understand the piano. I am always at work on repertoire, even at night. I don't seem to need very much sleep, I think, and I often memorize during the night. That is such a good time to work, for all is so quiet and still. I lie awake thinking of the music, and in this way I learn it. Or, perhaps it learns itself. For when I retire, the music is not yet mastered, not yet my own, but when morning comes, I really know it. Of course, I must know the words with great exactness, especially in songs. I shall do English songs in my coming song recital work, and the words and diction must be perfect, or people will criticize my English. I always write out the words of my roles, so as to be sure I understand them and have them correctly memorized. Keeping up repertoire most singers, I believe, need a couple of days, sometimes longer, in which to review a role. I never use the notes or score when going over a part in which I have appeared, for I know them absolutely, so there is no occasion to use the notes. Other singers appear frequently at rehearsal with their books, but I never take mine. 
My intimate knowledge of score, when I assisted my father in taking charge of operatic scores, is always a great help to me. I used to take charge of all the scores for him and knew all the cuts, changes, and just how they were to be used. The singers themselves often came to me for stage directions about their parts, knowing I had this experience. Yes, as you suggest, I could sing here in winter, then in South America in summer. Miss Musio accomplished this recently, with distinguished success, and had many thrilling adventures incident to travel. This would mean I would have no summer at all, for that season with them is colder than we have it here. No, I want my summer for rest and study. During the season at the Metropolitan, I give up everything for my art. I refuse all society and the many invitations I receive to be guest of honor here and there. I remain quietly at home, steadfastly at work. My art means everything to me, and I must keep myself in the best condition possible to be ready when the call comes to sing. One cannot do both, you know. Art and society do not mix well. I have never disappointed an audience. It would be a great calamity to be obliged to do so.